Ready? Good morning. Committee of one right here uh, so far. Uh, good morning. I'm Councilmember Robert Holden, Chair of the Committee on Technology. <clears throat> I would like to welcome you all to our hearing today. Uh, we will focus on the use of automated decision systems, or ADS, uh, as well as a follow-up with the ADS Task Force convened by Local Law 49 of 2018. An increasing number of cities and states are using ADS to process large amounts of data and make decisions. Among them are Los Angeles, Chicago, Washington, D.C., including many other states. In 2016, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services introduced a matching algorithm system that automatically disqualified individuals for food assistance when they were determined by the matching system to have an outstanding felony warrant. More than 19,000 people were improperly matched by this ADS, automatically disqualifying them from food assistance, even though they did not have an outstanding felony warrant. Uh, in New York City, ADS is making its way to many sectors, from criminal justice and education to public safety and beyond, being used uh, in predicting where crimes occur, a analysis, student placement in public schools, and fire risk assessments, among others. ADS often relies on an analysis of large amounts of data to infer correlations. Human intervention in the decision making may vary and may even completely elim be eliminated. ADS is a powerful tool that can vastly service the government by interpreting large amounts of data at times helping speed up government operations. While it is undeniable that these tools assist city agencies to operate more efficiently or effectively and offer residents more targeted and impactful service, algorithms are not always perfect. There have been particular situations in which algorithms produced wrong and biased outcomes, which I mentioned before. In many instances, the impact of a decision on people can be detrimental. Such decisions can be uh, related to access to public benefits, employment, medical treatment, or judicial sentences. Entrusting ADS in making or assisting in making such decision raises both ethical and legal issues. Therefore, without close examination of such a system, the benefits of it can be negated by the risks for individuals and result in discrimination and unfair practices. To ensure uh, that NYC ADS is fair, an ADS, uh, the ADS task force was established. The task force was tasked to provide recommendations on the development and implementation of a procedure that may be used by the city to determine whether an agency uh, automated decision system disproportionately impacts people. The task force was asked to investigate how the ADS makes decisions based on age, race, creed, color, religion, national origin, gender, disability, marital status, partnership status, caregiver status, sexual orientation, alienage, or citizenship status. New York City was the first city in the United States to convene such a task force. After 18 months, the task force issued a report. However, not every member of the task force agreed with the process and recommendation. It is also, it is, it's also remained unclear whether the recommendations were based on actual examination of ADS or just hypothetical examples. To ensure government transparency and accountability, the following bills will be considered today. Intro 1806, sponsored by Council Member Peter Kuhl, would require city agencies to provide information regarding every automated decision system used by the agency during the prior calendar year to the Mayor's Office of Operation. Such information would include what each automated decision system is intended to measure or reveal and a description of the decisions made or based on such system. Intro 1447, sponsored by Speaker Corey Johnson, would require the submission of an annual report by the Director of the Office of Data Analytics to the Mayor and the Speaker of the City Council 
describing data collected and maintained by city agencies. We look forward to establishing a better understanding of ADS and how it is used in New York City. We hope to work together with the administration on, in mitigating any negative impacts on our communities while working on positives and ensuring that we use tools to make government more effective. We also look forward to hearing the valuable testimonies from the administration, field experts, and community advocates. Um, I'm joined here by Councilman Peter Koo. You want to say um, something about your, your bill? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Holden, and thank you, um, Director Jeff and Kelly and Brittany. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for coming. Yeah, I'm Peter Ku, uh, the sponsor of the Bill 1806. Um, one of the biggest mysteries in city government is how automated decision systems are used to calculate algorithms. These systems are used by city government on a variety of decision making, from school zoning to resource allocations. We need to gain a greater understanding of how these algorithms are, and equations are being used to affect, uh, to affect resources. My bill looks to give legislators and the public a better understanding of how the city uses these algorithms. Not only do we need a better understanding of how these equations are calculated, but we should make these resources publicly available so that <clears throat> there is a full and transparent accounting of how we process our data. With this goal in mind, the Mayor's Office of Operations established the Automatic Decision Systems Task Force that issued a report recently uh, that unfortunately missed the mark of many of the more specific details about ADS. My bill looks to answer very particular questions. We need to know the guidelines for what each agency considers to be ADS. We need reporting on the names of these systems. We need to know what these systems are supposed to reveal. Descriptions of how information collected is used. Details on who developed these systems and their relationships with the city. We need timelines for their operations. Of course, this list can go on, but I think this is a good start. A true understanding of our automated system is a momentous undertaking, and I fully understand the task before us. But it must be an understanding we are willing to take if we are able to gain a clear understanding of how our computers are, are affecting our daily lives. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Council Member Koo. Uh, I also want to thank my, the staff of the Committee on Technology. We've been working overtime. They had two hearings in a row, so I want to thank them. Uh, Council Irene Bohofsky, Policy Analyst Charles Kim, Finance Analyst Florentine Kapoor, and my chief of staff, Daniel Casina, in the doorway there, and the communications director, Ryan Kelly. Um, also, uh, I want to introduce the first panel, and Brittany Saunders from New York City uh, Commission on Human Rights, uh, Jeff Thankitis Kasem, sorry, Jeff, uh, Mayor's Office of Operation, and Kelly Jin from MODA. You want to swear them in? Okay. I would like to ask you to raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth and only truth and answer honestly to council member questions? Thank you. You can start. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Holden and members of the Technology Committee, uh, Council Member Koo. Um, thank you to all who are in attendance and thank you to the council staff. Uh, my name is Jeff Tumkitik-Assem. I am the director of the Mayor's Office of Operations. 
I was the chair of the Automated Decision Systems Task Force, and today I'm joined uh, by former ADS Task Force co-chairs Kelly Jin, uh, director of the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics and Chief Analytics Officer for the City of New York, and Brittany Saunders, Deputy Commissioner of Strategic Initiatives at the New York City Commission on Human Rights. Uh, we thank you for the opportunity to testify today and to answer your questions. Uh, before I speak about our progress since the April 2019 hearing, uh, I just want to quickly recap some of the facts about the task force uh, to give some context. Uh, the law that created our task force, Local Law 49 of 2018, uh, required us to provide the mayor and speaker with a series of recommendations uh, related to city agencies' use of automated decision systems uh, with a particular focus on recommending protocols that could help members of the public obtain information about the tools and systems affecting them, and address any complaints or har of harm or bias connected with such tools or systems. The full list of mandates can be found on the task force uh, website and also in our report, uh, which was submitted to the mayor and city council speaker in November of 2019. To meet Local Law 49's requirements, the task force, led by three co-chairs and consisting of 17 academics, agency officials, activists, tech professionals, and issue advocates, met dozens of times between May 2018 and November of 2019. The administration's selection of task force members enabled the uh, coming together of diverse and sometimes divergent uh, perspectives under a very strong belief that the diversity of opinions from within and from outside the city government would ensure a more robust conversation, uh, resulting in a more balanced and realistic set of recommendations. And I'm very proud to say for the task force that that belief contributed uh, to our success. The ADS task force report was submitted to the mayor and uh, speaker it represents 18 months and countless hours of challenging conversations uh, that touched upon critical issues related to transparency, equity, efficiency, and innovation. Many of those conversations uh, we had to leave unresolved, uh, as our report attempts to make very clear. Um, given the overwhelming stature of the questions that we were tasked with uh, answering, um, or either the previously unseen complexities of issues that were revealed through our deliberations. We are very aware that not everyone believes these recommendations went far enough or deep enough, but nevertheless, these recommendations, which were developed with overwhelming consensus among the members of the task force, are tangible and actionable. They find agreement and ways forward despite differing opinions. And most importantly, these recommendations demonstrate a clear path forward and a call to action to continue the conversation to ensure the establishment of processes and functions that continue to evolve with a rapidly changing topic, which you've all recognized in your opening remarks. The report organizes our recommendations into three broad functional areas. First, we provide a series of recommendations related to centralizing and increasing resources for city government that could aid and empower agencies in the fair and equitable use and review of algorithms. Then we put forward a number of critical recommendations to create and boost public education around algorithms, something we found very often was a point of uh, conversation within our task force, and to create opportunities for the public to be active in the understanding of government use of algorithms. Finally, we recommend key tenants for ongoing agency and citywide management of these tools. I want to take a moment to speak in a bit more detail about the content of the task force recommendations and also the responsive actions that have followed since those recommendations were released. Our very first recommendation proposed the centralization of resources and algorithms management practices to better serve city agencies and to more effectively inform and engage with the public. The mayor acted swiftly on these recommendations, issuing Executive Order 50 which establishes the role of an Algorithms Management and Policy Officer, AMPO for short, uh, who will be named in the near future and who will report to me at the Mayor's Office of Operations. This new role is unique in city government and is intended to help agencies manage and to help the public understand the types of algorithmic tools and systems that agencies use to help make decisions. The AMPO will establish governing principles to guide city agencies in their work design and implement a framework, including criteria, to help agencies identify, prioritize, and assess algorithmic tools and systems, develop a robust, ongoing public engagement plan, and create and maintain a public-facing platform by which people can provide insights on these systems and their use. These tasks were identified by the task force as key areas for future work around algorithms, data, 
policy, and decision making. Members believed it was this type of work that would need to be adaptable over time as agencies build capacity and technologies, and as methods mature, and as technologies advance. Importantly, the executive order also created two committees that will support the AMPO in their work. A steering committee, composed of city officials, will advise the AMPO and me and will contribute insights relevant to their area of expertise. An advisory committee, composed of six members of the public, will advise on the protocols and best practices with regard to city use of algorithms and decision making. And it will help to channel public engagement into the work of the AMPO. Three of the members of the advisory committee will be selected by the mayor, and three will be selected by you, the city council. The existence of these committees and the information, insights, and expertise they will provide will be crucial to ensuring the AMPO's work does not take place in a vacuum and that the public's insight are continuously heard and considered. I'm very excited about the creation of this new role and I'm thrilled that the officer will work within the mayor's office of operations. We would not have been able to arrive at the task force recommendations without creating opportunities to engage with communities to discuss these issues. Um, as you know, at last year's hearing, uh, we heard calls from within and outside the task force to better engage with New Yorkers to hear what they had to say about automated decision making. We took that charge very seriously, and I can't stress that enough. We held a series of public forums and roundtables during the spring of, and summer of 2019. Our two public forums, open to all, were held at New York Law School and featured expert commentary from leading voices on the topic, and we fielded questions and comments from the public at those forums. As well, our roundtables, by contrast, were smaller events um, we, where we work directly with elected leaders and other stakeholders to bring together specific community members for a more targeted conversation in each borough. We want to thank Councilmember Koo and his team again for helping us set up the Queen's Library Roundtable. It was of great value to us and a great conversation. These two events, these events all were planned with full input input from all task force members and based on the task force members' suggestions for speakers and communities to speak to. Although we did not advertise each roundtable on our website, focusing instead on targeting community outreach, all task force members were involved, were encouraged to attend and to share information as appropriate with their networks. As you know from our last meeting in April 2019, one additional thing our members believed was lacking at the time uh, that they needed to perform their work was a clear sense of how specific agency tools actually worked. To help close that gap and respond to the request of our task force members, we as the chairs set up four agency presentations at the request of those task force members uh, from DOE, uh, DOT, FDNY, and NYPD. At these presentations, agency representatives walked members through some specific tools, described the purpose, development, and other key pieces of information on those systems that they felt were relevant. Agencies also answered questions from task force members as part of these presentations. When it was first convened, the task force was the first of its kind in the country, and as such began its work in uncharted territory. As you read in the report, this project was not without its challenges, and we want to accept those challenges. Last year, a number of task force members were dissatisfied with the group's progress, and we fielded tough but fair criticisms from you and members of the public who came to testify at the last hearing or spoke at our forums. We took that criticism very seriously. Based on that feedback, the task force as a whole adopted and committed to a more robust process for our internal planning and emphasized the public engagement opportunities I spoke of earlier. Most importantly, as a task force, we came better, we became better at listening to and learning from one another. As mentioned earlier, our task force was composed of people of diverse backgrounds and we did not always agree on every topic. But overwhelmingly, our task force members took seriously the difficult work assigned to us by the council, carving out time from their busy schedules to think through these challenging issues. In the interest of transparency, we made our disagreements and unresolved issues quite clear in the report. But our deliberations throughout the summer and fall were invaluable to promote a meaningful exchange of ideas and a real collective desire a collective desire to ensure that our group would not waste the opportunity we had before us to create meaningful, realistic, and implementable recommendations for this city. We are aware that our work would set a precedent for these issues for other governments, and while it should not be taken as the final word on this topic, and instead as an important and necessary first step, 
our report does reflect overwhelming consensus on a set of issues that were more, were more complex than any of us could have anticipated going in. It's our expectation that the soon to be named AMPO will carry forward the work of this task force and will create a robust framework by which agencies and offices can manage and report on their algorithms, related policies, and decisions. In the coming weeks, we anticipate the appointments to the advisory committee, posting new personal, uh, personnel vacancies for the AMPO support, and holding a series of public information sessions to better acquaint New Yorkers with this new function. We're also looking forward to working with the Council on Intro 1806. But as it written, we have concerns. In its current form, this proposed legis legislation would require each agency to produce individual reports based on potentially different interpretations of automated decision systems, which was a concern we raised in the prior ADS hearing and a concern raised within the task force member conversations. We believe that Executive Order 50 is the right solution as we embark upon the work ahead. A key goal of EO50 is to centralize leadership to manage and advise city agencies on their use of algorithms and other emerging technologies. We aim, with uh, the creation of the AMPO role and with support from the two new committees, to streamline efforts around this work, strengthen the related best practices citywide, and support agencies in better understanding algorithms and implementing these practices while also prioritizing the, val the invaluable input of public engagement and accountability. Transparency and public information are central tenets of the AMPO's work, and we support efforts to ensure New Yorkers have the information they need about how city agencies serve them. We welcome the opportunity to work with you to ensure that our shared goals of transparency are best aligned with agency operations and lessons learned from the very diverse conversations that occurred during the ADS Task Force. As we, leave, as we leave behind the process of the ADS task force, we're very excited to enter a new era of innovation and accountability, accountability in government use of uh, technology. Again, we thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Holden and Councilmember Ku. Uh, my name is Kelly Jin, and I am the Chief Analytics Officer and Chief Open Platform Officer for the City of New York, as well as the Director of the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on Introduction 1447 of 2019. The Mayor's Office of Data Analytics, also known as MODA, which was established by executive order in 2013 and codified in the city charter in 2018, supports city agencies in applying strategic analytical thinking to data in order to deliver services more equitably and effectively, and to increase operational transparency. MODA works in close partnership with her colleagues at the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications, Do It, to oversee and implement the city's open data program. A testament to the potential of government transparency, New York City's open data program is the country's largest municipal source of free public data. At over 2,000 data sets published by approximately 90 city agencies, offices, and commissions, and nearly 120,000 users per month. To support this mission, each year Moda and Doit conduct a robust open data compliance recruitment, training, and reporting process where agency open data coordinators collaborate with staff within their agencies to identify new data sets, highlight data sets in need of updates or revision, update metadata and data set documentation, and prioritize open data work for the next year. Tomorrow, January 23rd, we will actually be kicking off the year by convening open data coordinators to review this year's upcoming key milestones. City agencies, city council, advocates, and the public are key partners in continuing to advance New York City as a national leader in open data and our vision for open data for all. Since the passage of the original open data law, Local Law 11 of 2012, Eight more pieces of legislation have made important contributions to this world-class program and its implementation. Thanks to the City Council's passage of Local Law 8 of 2016, which introduced the examination and verification requirement, also known as ENV, MODA carried out further steps to review agency compliance with the existing open data law. 
Through the ENV process, we assisted nine agencies over three years with an internal data set review process with the mission to identify public data sets. The implementation of this law led to the, led to the identification of 57 additional data sets for publication on NYC Open Data. Because of the success of the ENV process, in our December 2019 ENV report, we committed to adopting elements of the process into our annual open data program and uh, compliance cycle. Through ENV, MODA has already seen the benefits of furthering guidance to augment and streamline the identification of data sets. With introduction 1447, we appreciate City Council's forward-thinking efforts to update and expand data set identification and cataloging for New York City. The proposed introduction 1447 aligns with the Open Data Program's mission to engage New Yorkers through increasing transparency in the information that is produced and used by city government. From an implementation perspective, we seek to ensure that introduction 1447 does not duplicate or misalign with elements of the existing annual compliance process and incorporates the best practices and lessons learned through the past decade of open data collaboration and the ENV process. We would like to continue to work with both the council and advocates to build on all of our past efforts and ultimately share a holistic view of New York City's data. We recognize that New York City data sets are as dynamic as New York City itself and are constantly striving to improve the program. I invite Chair Holden and all council members to join us at any event during the city's fourth annual Open Data Week Festival, which we will co-host in partnership with Beta NYC from February 28th through March 7th, 2020, get an extra day because it's a leap year this year. Uh, one of the nation's largest public data celebrations, NYC Open Data Week 2020, will encompass dozens of events and engage thousands of New Yorkers. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today. We look forward to working with Council to continue the important work of the Open Data Program. Well, thank you for your testimonies. Uh, it was uh, uh, quite interesting. And uh, you were, um, and I, we spoke, uh, I think last year, and this was a daunting task you guys were facing. We understand there was a number of meetings, and um, but can you just go over some of the risks and benefits of using ADS? Any anybody? Sure, I I think that um, from at least the task force perspective, uh, there were, uh, you know. As we took a look at kind of what was going on within the city government and having a broad conversation, one of the key risks was obviously a lot of efforts around um, algorithms and other things were simply taking existing processes and trying to enable more efficient and effective ways of doing it. Some of that was using as much data as they could collect um, and trying to develop rules that were just modeled after everyday transactions that they were already performing um, by hand. Um, and a lot of the things that we discovered at the task force was just kind of the um, inconsistency in the type of capacity and capabilities across all different agencies, uh, a recognition that there weren't any particular guidelines or criteria on how to look at them or how to recognize them, um, and also kind of this um, you know, awareness that it was all pretty new and moving pretty quickly. And a part of the risk is just that a lot of people in New York government are just trying to serve kind of their communities and doing it as the best they can. Some of them, they don't have as much information as they, they would like. Uh, there are a lot of concerns around privacy rules and other kind of uh, uh, security issues about sharing data across different agencies that might help. Uh, there's a lot of understanding that there's data that's being collected out in the field by uh, interactions between individuals, but it's not always documented in a good way. So there was a kind of a broad mix of kind of uh, risks and kind of uh, concerns people might have because there isn't a lot of that guidance. There isn't a lot of centralized kind of review of what that might be. There wasn't a lot of criteria that people could use in a more concrete way. And there's a lot, not a lot of consistent training across different agencies. At the same time, obviously, there are a lot of benefits, as people have recognized within the conversations, about how such things can advance, can make sure we can be uh, broader in our reach um, to do things faster and to enable kind of more uh, processes to occur. And those are all things that the task force were trying to balance within their conversations. Great. Um, as to the report, who drafted the report? Um, so the task force members kind of uh, engaged I want to step back a little bit and just kind of recognize once again something I said within the uh, 
uh, my opening testimony. I think that we understand as a task force that there were a lot of concerns up front with the kind of process that we were going through. A lot of dissatisfaction about the conversation. Sometimes people felt that a lot of the conversations were a bit circular because we kept kind of running into the same questions about what does it mean? What are the kind of uh, constraints that we have? And we took that very seriously. And while at the same time, again, uh, openly accepting that the process was not was flawed was not working in the beginning we focused on redirecting and really solidifying the process with the input of the task force members um, I say that because ultimately a core value of the task force members all of them was to provide consensus recommendations they wanted to put out something that they all kind of agreed to um, that did not mean that every task force member had to agree with everything and that was a stated kind of uh, fact within our conversation we were never going to agree on every piece, but we did want to get to consensus. So as we started to get closer to the end and we started to move towards more concrete recommendations, it was very, um, it was our process to kind of take what people were saying, documenting down and provide it back to the task force members to review. There was iteration and review so that everyone can kind of recommend. Ultimately, we took um, those uh, comments and recommendations and the different versions of those and collapse them into the task force recommendation. Again, I want to be clear that we were very, very um, particular about trying to have a section that represented the recommendations that where we reached consensus, but also transparent about the areas through which we, we did not, where we either found that we did not have enough time, issues were unresolved, and we wanted to paint a picture of these are recommendations that the task force kind of recommended through their iteration process. They reviewed the language, they understood and agreed what was going to be put on paper, and also they agreed on the language about areas that uh, where the task force members did not reach consensus, where there were open questions and where they felt if we did the work of the initial set of recommendations, you could get to and further the conversation around these other areas. So it's, it's, got, it's an ongoing thing. The consensus, because it, it says in the report, I believe, there was no consensus was reached among the task force members at one point. Is that correct? Or are we just... Well, I, yeah. No, so to clarify, I, mean, yes. I think um, one of the points that's been raised um, by other folks is that you know, they don't believe there was consensus. There was, in fact, consensus. This was actually something that came out of task force members themselves who said, we want to present um, a document that reflects consensus, which again, to Def Jeff's point, does not mean that everyone agrees on every single point, but it does mean that they did the hard work of not just kind of articulating their preferred perspectives, but really digging in together and figuring out where the points of agreement were so they could put those forward as kind of a framework for like recommendations to the city. Uh, also just to reinforce kind of Jeff's points around process, like we did have a very extensive process of deliberation wherein we took in all the different recommendations and insights that had come to us via the community sessions, oh I'm sorry about that, or um, via the task force members themselves or via members of the public, um, all sorts of sources. We put those all in front of the task force members so they all came before us for review and that was kind of the source matter for the recommendations that we eventually developed. So the content really came out of those conversations amongst the task force members. So the attendance at these meetings, uh, you had 17, 18 people at trying to come up with a solution or a consensus. Um, was that, so sometimes these meetings would run on and on. Is that true? Like, how many hours would they run? I mean, I don't think I have a solid number. I think you're absolutely right, though. I mean, Did you ever have like a 12-hour, 8-hour meeting? Or? Mm, no, I don't, I don't think, think we had any 12-hour meetings, I think no. certainly some of our preps and then into the public forums would last a good four or five hours. Mm -hmm. Uh, internal deliberations would also be kind of three to four hours and, uh, you know, multiple times a week. So we set it up. I mean, look, I think the council and, and uh, the task force members kind of who were on there uh, have diverse careers, and this was all something they were doing on top of their careers. We found time to get them together. Obviously, we always preferred in-person conversations. Mm -hmm. We relied on email. Uh, we relied on conference calls. Um, in terms of like how many people would uh, be in a room, I'm not, you know, except for a couple of the kickoffs and some of the public forums where we'd have everyone, some of the conversations may have had, you know, eight to ten people, but maybe not the full roster. At the same time, people called in, people provided input on email when they did, and others did not. So was that a hurdle in, in the, uh, the task force, not getting everybody there and then you're know, kind of spinning your wheels and then you're going backwards? I, uh, I, I mean, there, is there a point where there's too many people on the task force? Is that, would you like to weigh in as an opinion? 
Uh, I don't know that I think the number of people on the task force was an issue. I think the issue is that these are really challenging questions that we had to grapple with. And people came into the room speaking different languages because some of us are folks from government who have expertise on different policy areas. Some of us are folks from, you know, advocates on various um, uh, social justice or racial justice issues. Some of us were computer scientists and data scientists. There, there was a lot of conversation just to kind of get ourselves on the same page and speak the same language. All right. So we know it, it is reflected in the report that you experienced difficulties even defining ADS, uh, although ADS is defined in Local Law 49. What is your definition of ADS? This is a basic question. Yeah, no. <laughs> ultimately, we took the definition of the law. Um, we took the definition of the law, and then we used that as the basis point to kind of provide recommendations around providing more specific guidance, you know, that might apply to agencies. That's the work of the AMPO, is actually to work with the agencies to kind of better delve into particular criteria. Right. But, but can, you, you, can you just touch upon some of the uh, objections from the task force members in defining ADS, some, some of the comments uh, that you might have heard? Oh, I mean, I think that, yeah, I think as Brittany kind of um I mean, people were coming from different, different yeah, areas. Yeah, people were coming from different places, so some people would kind of like up front think about kind of just uh, an Excel file being, uh, or a calculator. So we had mm -hmm. that, you know, as the example in our last council hearing uh, where we mentioned there were some kind of uh, people trying to kind of figure out, does it apply as broadly as simply a one-time off worksheet that they were using to, to calculate some formulas or a calculator. So uh, Local Law 49 does not expressly require the review or examination of ADS. It merely requires recommendations. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. Um, the examination requirement is implied, and it, it is possible to provide, um, it's, it's impossible to provide a meaningful recommendation without reviewing the subject matter. Um, did you review any ADS used by New York City agencies? Yeah, I think what we tried to do is, as we heard um, from task force members wanting to kind of get a better sense of things, uh, we recognized up front that there uh, wasn't a comprehensive kind of place to go to kind of grab a, uh, algorithms and it wasn't kind of practical to do so. So we kind of tried to close the gap by engaging with several of our agency partners to come in and provide presentations and talk about their processes. So we did in fact have the task force members meet with several agencies, review and get presentations and discuss what that meant. Um, in your interview with Tech News, the Tech News outlet, The Verge, and, and in letters to Councilman Peter Koo, former chair of the committee, you indicated that you are reviewing examples from DOE and, and DOT. Uh, could you quote some of those or some of the... I mean, I think what we did was um, we... Or can you comment on the process? Yeah, yeah. Uh, from a process standpoint, what we did was essentially we uh, went out to several of the agencies who were either participating in the uh, task force or who were otherwise engaged by providing guidance. We asked for them to kind of provide some examples that they would um, be able to kind of present to the task force. They would come in. They would have some of their people articulate some of the things that they felt were relevant. Again, there was no kind of guiding criteria or uh, uh, guidance, but we just asked them to kind of just give some sense so we could get, uh, as a task force, a better um, opportunity to discuss what they felt was uh, relevant, what they felt were their challenges. Uh, we did that with the DOE. We did that with a DOT. Uh, we did that with FDNY. Um, so we brought in several agencies to talk through that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, council member, we've been joined by Council Member Yeager. Uh, council Member Ku, I know you have another committee meeting. Um, so do you want to? Yes, I'll just, I'm going to sure. come back to yeah, some yeah. questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Hold on. Um, uh, do you know what agencies are using uh, AD, uh, ADS systems? And, uh, ADS means automated decision-making systems. Yeah. Do you know any agencies right now using it? I think that there are, are several. I think one of the main goals of the recommendations of the task force is actually to um, centralize within one you know, body, uh, mm -hmm. the AMPO, kind of the ability to provide better guidance on criteria so that agencies can better and more consistently take a look within their own um, kind of operations and, and identify which systems are kind of in use and how to better assess them. So did the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics work with the Department of HPD 
uh, on the proactive preservation initiative, uh, a system developed to preemptively identify at risk buildings. Uh, no? Speaking on behalf of the mayor's office of data analytics, not not particularly familiar with that uh, system. Okay. So, do you know any agencies that created uh, ADS in house? Or the I think we're aware that um, several people have, uh, several agencies have developed um, algorithms, are using it for several systems. I think that one of the key tasks of the AMPO is actually to provide better guidelines so we're all talking the same language. I don't think that anyone's denying that several, uh, many, if not all agencies, use some um, algorithms or, or uh, automated tools to kind of help them in their functions. If anything, what we try to do is to provide opportunities for the task force members to meet with some of the agencies to talk about them, but also to understand some of the uh, you know, concerns around not having consistent definitions or consistent criteria to help them guide what a, a further kind of review could look like. So would you say a majority of agencies uh, uh, utilize uh, ADS by contracting with third parties? I couldn't speak to that, sir. I can. I know that obviously a majority of uh, agencies do use algorithms of some sort, um, and they use systems to kind of help them in their everyday operations to serve New Yorkers. In terms of contracting or in-house, uh, I'm not quite sure, and I'm not sure. You know, I think that's part of the uh, effort to kind of identify how they, um, wherever they think that they may need some outside expertise. I think they are looking for it, but I also know that there are a lot of capabilities within certain agencies to kind of do their own thing. Thank you. Thank you for your leadership in the Thank you. For the Thank you. Thank you. Um, just to follow up on that, um, so some agencies that are using in-house uh, ADS. Um, Andrew White spoke about predictive analytics tools used by ACS, um, and they were created in-house. So did you examine that that particular one? No. I don't think we actually examined any. Uh, Andrew was a part of our task force, yeah, so, so he mentioned a couple of things that they were trying. But you didn't review their no. their in-house creation, so that's. No, we, but that's what we're we're trying to get. You know, we're trying to get a lasso around some of these. Oh, totally. And I, I guess yeah. what I would say is, obviously, several examples were raised, but part of the effort of the task force um, was to provide recommendations that wouldn't try to stop at any type of point in time kind of examination, but to really build a broader capacity to enable New York across multiple agencies to do this work going into the future. I think there was a lot of conversation that, yes, there might be uh, agencies who are working on certain algorithms or tools now, but they're going to develop new ones. There are also new technology advancements that are going to happen. We didn't want to stop at recommendations to just said, here are the things you have to do right now, but really focus on building a capacity that would ensure um, not just, uh, one, the ability to kind of provide broader guidelines and the <coughs> consistency across the city, but two, also to build up the uh, capacity to push a culture of reviewing those, and three, to really enable change over time, because you know, too static wouldn't help us in this environment at, by any means. All the task force members readily agreed about that. Okay. So you don't know how, but you don't know what DOE is doing with uh, ADS, uh, right? Or, or the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, or uh, specifically. So again, we had a, a series. Well, you, you might, Jeff, I know well, about well, that. I mean, I, I think that, um, I think there's two parts to that that I'll give as an answer. Obviously, I think that there are all of us who are all working in different parts of government probably have different kind of experiences with different things. But from a task force, we didn't take it as our charge specifically to kind of go into every agency and review because we felt it was more important to kind of build the capacity for how to do it. We were all having discussions for the first six months about just the definition of it. So by the time we got to recommendations, we really wanted to focus on what we could do going forward. Right, but there were no recommendations of how certain agencies can use it and use it better and, and actually get more information uh, and and really advance. So, so um, that that will come in the next step or um, in in review or um, yeah, with, with the officer that we're going to create a position for the officer to oversee this. Yeah, I mean, I think that they the, will. Ex you think they will examine each each agency or if we could break it out, I think that I mean, and to be perfectly honest, I think that we focused on an AMPO and an office with, you know, capacity and capabilities so that they can start the work 
of identifying and developing guidelines and criteria because that was a main tenant of what our conversations were amongst the task force members to have that capacity, not just to kind of jump in there and try to ferret things out. Obviously, as a part of that, their effort is to allow for city agencies to have the guidance criteria to identify which systems are in place, which would be relevant, and how to further assess them. That is the goal. But I don't think it was kind of charging in and right away start digging through. I think it was definitely focused on first building internal capacity, consistency across agencies, and ensure that they could all do their review and have the AMPO as a body that could support them and guide them. Yeah, just a basic question on, yeah. the, on the task force, because uh, we probably should know this, but were there specific agencies that were invited to join in on the task force, uh, city agencies, yes. that you identified? Yeah. So there were several city agencies that participated on the task force alongside advocates in various spaces and, um, you know, computer science types, data science types. So it was... Uh, uh, you know, obviously our agencies, um, DOE, DOT, um, Mayor's Office of the Criminal Justice Coordinator, uh, yeah. <laughs> a criminal, uh, and ACS, ACS um, DSS. D DSS, DSS, and PD. PD. Yeah, sorry, it's been a while since I wrote. Well, I'm that. sorry, the last one? A PD, PD was the last PD. one. Yeah, the police department um, should, yeah, that, uh, so there's, there's six then. The six agencies that were represented, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Any others invited aside, that? Uh, aside the, uh, aside from the, the yeah. three of us. All right. Okay. We're in addition to. All right. Let, let, let me just talk about privacy now, because that seems to be a concern of many. Uh, we understand that the review of some ADS may raise privacy concerns. For example, training data may include personally identifiable information (PII). However, local law 49. Uh, does not require the review of ADS with personally identifiable information. Also, these ADS probably could be reviewed with protective orders. Um, uh, so in your report, the importance of a public education was mentioned. Um, how, how was that, how would you talk about that in, in the task force? You mean like uh, public education efforts? Yes, engagement? because a lot of people have this fear, you know. With, yeah. So that, you have to overcome that. Is, is there a, uh, a strategy to overcome that or to get the information out? I mean, I think that's part of the, the goal of the AMPO is to like identify what those conversations need to be by being in kind of communication and contact with members of the community. And I can talk a little bit about how we did that during the task force phase. But um, uh, I think that's certainly one of the goals is to create a robust public engagement plan that acknowledges some of these, these issues and concerns. Yeah, because yeah. we know yeah. when the public doesn't know, yeah. then mm -hmm. the fear goes up and I the public doesn't right. have any idea that the ADS exists and all of a sudden they find out yep. and why the, the, the something happened. Uh, they, so they have more fear, obviously. They, they feel like uh, big brothers after them. And You're absolutely right. And yeah. one of the focuses of the executive order were actually to focus on in three different areas public engagement. The first, obviously, um, was to ensure that one of the responsibilities of the AMPO would be to further public education and engagement. And that comes in two forms. The first is, out of the task force, we really wanted to make sure that the public was better, educa better educated. In some of our public forums and small community forums, it was clear people had a lot more questions about what it was than even kind of its use. You know, just a lot of conversations. And so that public uh, education campaign to say, this might be considered, these are the components, this is how it might be um, advanced, those are all part of the recommendations that came out of the task force. The secondary part is actually then to then engage the public to get better feedback because we know we didn't want to talk about it in a vacuum. We had already spent some time mm -hmm. kind of trying to, in the first couple of months where I readily admit the process might have been a little um, too kind of narrowly focused about internal bubble con uh, conversations and we really wanted to expand that. The other part of it was we created the um, advisory committee. And that advisory committee is supposed to be um, staffed by both um, uh, appointees from the council and from the mayor to represent the public, to invite uh, further conversations, to identify opportunities to go out and talk about these issues, and to bring in concerns, especially when there might be some fear and some concern about it. And we don't, um, you know, people may not want to kind of speak directly and they want to go through these um, kind of uh, appointees to kind of raise their issues. So I think that's absolutely right. I want to touch on the other part that you brought up in terms of privacy. Um, one of the big recognitions of the task force and why 
we were so focused on developing the guidelines, criteria, and processes is because there was a recognition that privacy kind of implications impact every agency a bit differently. So it was too hard to have a blanket statement about what privacy would mean. PII, when related to kind of human services, medical services, security, you know, law enforcement, they all kind of differ slightly. And particularly in terms of sharing data and trying to kind of uh, talk about them in a total, didn't work out that way. And so we wanted to kind of give that time to kind of develop particular, um, to leverage the fact that the New York already has very strong kind of privacy guidelines, but kind of to develop them and apply them in a more um, consistent uh, process. You know, the only problem with government is they never get the information out in the right way, or at least uh, often enough to remind people. And that's what we've seen in, uh, you know, that, that's inherent in, in government. But just we saw getting, that with the task force. Yes, we saw it, yeah. And, and, and that's, so you, but you do believe that every person affected by ADS should know about it, right? Yes. A certain, I mean, in a certain regard, it should yes. be some kind of information. Yes. Program. Good. Um, how is it that a person would know they have been affected by an agency's use of an algorithm tool or system? How, how would that? Yeah. I mean, so I'll break that out into two different parts because I yeah. want to give Brittany an opportunity. One of the things that the task force uh, readily recognized is that we wanted to break out two different things. Um, there are decisions that are being made uh, by agencies uh, across New York City that um, impact New Yorkers. There are already existing structures for how people might challenge or question those decision makings. And we didn't want to create arbitrary processes when things already exist. And I'll let Brittany mm -hmm. speak a little bit more to that. But secondarily, we certainly understand that beyond individual decisions, algorithms do play a part. And we wanted to provide um, guidance and the AMPO is responsible in the Executive Order 50. They clearly lay out that they have to kind of figure out not just uh, a process by which there's a central place to kind of receive those, but also an ability for that AMPO to work with the agencies to review underlying kind of algorithms or systems that might play into those decisions. But I do, don't want to get too far away and get back to Brittany to kind of talk about the existing structures that already exist. Yeah, I was just going to share a little bit about, um, I think, the Commission's interest in this stuff, um, because, you know, the Commission has kind of a long interest in these questions that dates back to roughly 2015, so even before my own arrival at the agency. So I think um, we recognize that um, tools were being marketed for the purpose of, of assisting in um, decision making in areas of our jurisdiction. And so in order to kind of bolster our own understanding of these issues, we began consulting with computer scientists and data scientists and as well as um, legal experts external to government to kind of build our own internal understanding and also help us uh, develop some relationships that ultimately proved useful in the task task force process. Um, and so what I would say is like we, um, I think in our view discrimination is discrimination, whether it's happening through some sort of uh, paper-based process or through the use of an algorithm. So we um, would definitely encourage folks who are concerned about that uh, to reach out to us. As written in Executive Order 50, will the recommendations of the steering committee and advisory committee uh, be available to the public? You know, so you know, the, the uh, algorithm with, um, officer, um, will that be available to the public? Any, any you know, the, what was it, AMP, AMPO? Yeah, AMPO. it's just shorter. <laughs> yeah, AMPO is that's uh, better, yes. Would that be uh, that information, uh, you know, the, rec the recommendations? Um, so again, as written in Executive Order 50, will the recommendations of the steering committee and advisory committee be available to the public? So that's the question. So I think there are two parts. One, just up front, executive order kind of has a reporting requirement within it so that there can be an annual report out, just one. Two, in terms of the conversations, I think there, there are formal recommendations or kind of uh, agreements on things. I think those will certainly be kind of uh, public. But I also believe that the advisory and the steering committee will have a role where they're, you know, having constant conversations and advising on certain issues that come up as opposed to any formal recommendations. I Mostly just to be pretty transparent about it. I think that the format of it is to be able to kind of have in continued internal discussions. Some of those may result in specific recommendations, but some of those will just simply be recommend, uh, conversations about um, opportunities to go certain places and talk about certain things in different ways or particular priorities to kind of place, but they won't represent any formal recommendation. All right, we did that, right? Yeah, okay. 
All right. Um, talk about intro 1806. Uh, we require city agencies to provide the mayor's office of operations with information regarding every automated decision system used by the agency during the prior calendar year, including what each automated decision system is intended to measure or reveal and a description of the decisions made or based on ADS. The Mayor's Office of Operation would then be required to compile this information and report it to the Mayor and the Speaker of the City Council every year. Um, and again, um, that that's there. There's a do. Do we know what agencies are using ADS or intend to to use it yet? Did you do you identify? Uh, no, sir. And I and, think and, that there. And that yeah, yeah. That's the that's a little bit of a because we have to know. I mean, don't we going in? Yeah, I think that you know one of the values of the task force recommendations obviously was transparency, but also to do it in an actionable and realistic uh, way. Um, the executive order very much focuses on providing and building the capacity, the processes, and the guidelines and criteria that were very much discussed by the diverse task force members as things necessary to kind of help agencies to actually do their assessment of what systems are being used or not. So while there is certainly support for kind of the intent, I think there is a lot more focus on trying to uh, build the capacity to do it in a holistic, robust way, um, not just kind of as a crash course exercise. Okay. Anything else you guys want to add? Or? No. I mean, I think um, just to say thank you for having us here, and I think we learned quite a bit through the process and excited to continue this work. Yeah. And I would just say, I, I mean, one, we as I said in the opening testimony, we value the fact that the council kind of raised some really tough questions for us. It forced us to kind of further down, kind of modify our process. It was not something that um, was easy. And, but at the same time, at the end, the task force came together and actually put out recommendations that they felt really proud of. I certainly am proud of them. I think that the city should be proud of the fact that there is uh, an opportunity for New York to establish an ongoing process with clear guidelines and criteria that kind of leads into the future and isn't a reactive thing to any one particular issue, which we might see in other municipalities. I think that New York is taking a holistic review and process around this and is committed to it. So it's uh, I guess we're pioneers in this. You guys are uh, the first to do it, and New York City is, so uh, we thank you for the process and we thank you for your, your efforts. And it was very, very, uh, it was a complicated ordeal as you described. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you for you. your support. Thanks. Okay, uh, the first, the second panel. Rashida Richardson, uh, AI Now Institute. Um, Laura Hecht Fellella, I'm sorry, it's hard to read this. Um, Brennan. The Brennan Center. And Daniel Schwartz from the New York Civil Liberties Union. Uh, whoever wants to start, press the, press the button on there. Chairman, ooh, <laughs> sorry. Um, Chairman Holden, members of the Committee on Technology, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Rashida Richardson, and I'm the Director of Policy Research at the AI Now Institute at New York University. AI Now is the first university research institute dedicated to the understanding the social implications of artificial intelligence. Part of my role is researching the increasing use and reliance on data-driven technologies, including government use of automated decision systems, which I'll refer to as ADS, and, the, and then designing and implementing policy and legal frameworks to address and mitigate problems identified in this research. Nationally, state and local governments are increasingly turning to ADS and other data-driven processes to aid and supplant human decision-making and government procedures in various sensitive social domains. 
These systems determine where a child will go to school, who will be, um, who will go to jail before their trial, who will have their food subsidies terminated, how much Medicare benefits a person is entitled to, and who is likely to be a victim of a crime. While these new technologies are often hailed for their time-saving and cost-cutting and even bias-reducing potential, the actual implementation of these technologies demonstrate a very different reality described in detail in my written testimony. These failures have diminished public trust and safety, facilitated discrimination, reduced the efficacy of government services, deterred people from government services or benefits they're entitled to, and increased government expenditures, both from the hidden cost of implementation and subsequent litigation expenses. Yet, in spite of these recurring and harmful outcomes, government reliance on ADS persists and is likely to drastically increase, particularly in light of policy changes made by the Trump administration that are detailed in my written testimony. And this all demonstrates the need for legislative and regulatory interventions. In November 2019, Mayor de Blasio published the New York City Automated Decision Systems Task Force report, which culminated an 18-month process that most hope would result in recommendations on regulatory and policy interventions that the city could implement to address the concerns regarding the city's use of ADS. Yet after months of no community education and minimal public engagement, we still have no clear understanding of ADS use by city agencies and no clear plan for how New York City could expeditiously and critically address ADS issues. This is why me, several other advocates, including these people here, um, researchers and community members, published Confronting Black Boxes, a shadow report of the New York City Automated Decision System Task Force. The shadow report not only provides a robust counter-narrative to the New York City Automated Decision Task Force process, but it includes over 70 recommendations with rationales on next steps for a variety of stakeholders in New York City and state. The recommendations range from pre-deployment considerations for agencies wishing to acquire or use an ADS, policy and practical changes that can be implemented at an agency level, legislative changes to improve the procurement process, investigatory and oversight actions that can be taken by different agency officials, tips for community members and advocates interested in ADS accountability issues. I hope that in addition to considering the legislative proposals before the committee today, that the City Council will evaluate the policy interventions proposed in our shadow report and work with other city officials and agencies to implement our recommendations. Due to the brevity of time, I cannot cover the entirety of my written testimony, but I would like to end by noting that the full testimony explains why Intro 1806 is an important next step in creating greater transparency regarding the city's use of ADS, and that Intro 1447 requires several amendments to effectively create transparency on the role of big data in city agencies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, members of the Committee on Technology. Thank you, Chairman Holden, for holding this hearing and inviting the Brennan Center to testify. My name is Laura hecht Falella. I'm a legal fellow with the Liberty and National Security Program at the Brennan Center for Justice. We are a nonpartisan law and policy institute that focuses on promoting government accountability and ensuring that government use of new technologies does not violate fundamental rights. While emerging technologies like automated decision systems, ADS, make it possible for government agencies to work more efficiently, they also have the potential to exacerbate inequalities and bias. This is particularly true when it comes to law enforcement. The Brennan Center has advocated for greater oversight of the NYPD's surveillance tools, including their use of ADS, before the New York, uh, before the New York City Council and the Automated Decision Systems Task Force. We also contributed to the report published by AI Now in December, Confronting Black Boxes. The launch of the ADS Task Force in May 2018 positioned New York City as a leader in the regulation of government use of ADS. Unfortunately, the task force fell short of its mandate. It was unable to produce substantive policy recommendations or meaningfully engage with the public. It also failed to effectively utilize the numerous resources proffered by a coalition of organizations, including the Brennan Center. The two bills proposed today, intros 1447 and 1806, are important first steps in remediating some of the task force's missed opportunities. Mandating an annual inventory of, of agency data and requiring reporting on agency use of ADS are essential. Oversight, as Chairman Holden, you spoke earlier, is impossible without an understanding of what, how, why, and when ADS are being used by city agencies. As the City Council engages in efforts to regulate ADS, it's important that it does not carve out an exception for the NYPD. 
Based on the limited public information available, we believe the NYPD employs ADS in its use of automated license plate readers, facial recognition, predictive policing, and social media monitoring, among others. However, it's likely there are many other ADS that the public and city council simply do not know about. For example, my organization's difficulty in obtaining basic information about the NYPD's predictive policing model underscores why it's so important for ADS transparency bills to include law enforcement. After three years of Freedom of Information Act litigation, we received heavily redacted documents that failed to provide key details like what data is inputted into their pr predictive policing model or how the results are used. By design, their system does not store inputs or outputs, making it difficult to assess the algorithm's effectiveness or potential for bias. ADS have wide-ranging consequences when used by law enforcement because they can perpetuate and exacerbate bias in policing practices. An algorithm is only as good as its data, and a flawed and racially discriminatory data is being inputted into the NYPD's ADS models. It is likely that the resulting outcomes will reinforce and replicate the same prejudices. The recommendations made in Confronting Black Boxes report are a starting point in addressing these issues. The NYPD should be required to maintain a public updated list of the ADS technologies it uses and provide a simple description of how each system works. It should conduct a system, systemic uh, examination of how different racial and ethnic groups will be affected by each ADS and provide an opportunity for meaningful public feedback. Lastly, the NYPD should not sign vendor contracts that restrict auditing of ADS or prevent public disclosure of basic information regarding how the systems work. In addition, we urge the City Council to pass the POST Act, which would require the NYPD to disclose basic information about the surveillance tools it uses and the existing safeguards to protect the privacy and civil liberties of New Yorkers. The POST Act is a valuable companion to today's in, uh, bills because it requires more complete reporting on the M NYPD's use of surveillance technologies, including ADS. Transparency and oversight are essential features of a strong democracy, and the Brennan Center commends the Council for addressing these critical and timely issues. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I'm happy to answer any questions. <clears throat> My name is Daniel Schwartz, and I'm testifying on behalf of the New York Civil Liberties Union. We thank the Chairman and the Council for holding this hearing and for the opportunity to provide testimony today. To date, automated decision systems are mostly deployed, lacking any regulation or transparency. Many studies have challenged their opaque or black box operation and provide evidence of harmful, discriminatory, sexist, and racist outcomes. In our written testimony, we call for urgently needed regulation, transparency, impact assessments, and independent audits. We provide examples of cases where only through extensive litigation and subsequent disclosure of the system source code, the inaccuracy was revealed, as in a Medicaid ADS in Arkansas that had failed to assess care needs of patients and remove the service. Or here in New York City, where an independent review of the source code of a DNA analysis tool raised serious questions about its validity, including whether the code may have been intentionally skewed to create more matches. ADS are only as good as their data. If an ADS utilizes false or biased data, its outputs will repeat this pattern and in turn result in false and biased decision making. Researchers recently discovered that a widely used healthcare algorithm used to identify patients' health risks failed to identify many black patients, making them less likely to be enrolled for medical treatment. And where these systems operate in secret, people may not even realize that they are suffering at the hands of a flawed AI. One ADS in Indiana blocked hundreds of thousands of people from receiving vital support services and left, left them struggling to challenge these decisions. Much of what we know about ADS use in New York City is pieced together from disparate sources, such as public records requests, litigation, procurement data, employee information, and press statements. It is safe to assume that ADS are used by virtually all city agencies. In November 2018, the city joined the city's coalition for digital rights and signed its declaration, which explicitly states, and I quote, Everyone should have access to understandable and accurate information about the technological, algorithmic, and artificial intelligence systems that impact their lives, and the ability to question and change unfair, biased, or discriminatory systems. We urge the Council to uphold this promise by enacting legislation that will serve our democratic values and create the regulatory mechanisms necessary to prote protect against harmful and discriminatory algorithms. The NYCLU supports Intro 1806 as a first step toward closing the overwhelming information gap around the use of ADS. New Yorkers currently lack even the most basic information about what these systems are and how agencies are using them. A disclosure requirement will help the public and policymakers alike understand the current terrain, craft better and more targeted oversight mechanisms, aid people in finding help when they feel they are unfairly impacted by a decision, and drive public education opportunities. 
However, the proposed legislation defines ADS very broadly. This over-inclusivity could make the disclosure requirement unworkable for agencies to compile and tedious for the public to review. We therefore recommend a very narrow carve-out that would exclude certain tools, for example, routine software tools for internal cybersecurity procedures, such as update schedulers, antivirus, and network security, or routine software tools for data backups, retention, and deletion. Without giving the public tools to know that these systems even exist and to provide them with the information needed to assess their usefulness and impact, we are in grave danger of outsourcing government decision-making to ever more opaque tools that could automate bias and strip us of our most fundamental rights. Thank you. Um, thank, you for, uh, thank you for the report. Um, how many were involved in the shadow report here? Around 30 groups in um, com Piling the recommendations, and then we got endorsements from individual and organizational um, groups. Um, you heard the uh, administration's testimony about um, the AMPO, the officer that's going to oversee that. What do you think about that? Um, it's a little concerning because it doesn't seem like that officer is given much authority to get access to information, and it doesn't seem like and a person in that position would be able to make concrete recommendations on guidelines or even procedures to address a lot of the concerns that we have with ADS without actually knowing the oper how these systems are operationalized within agencies. So even with some of the recommendations that we provide in the shadow report, that's based on empirical research on these uses, but they would um, have to be applied in a manner that's um, conforming to the way that they're used within city agencies. So you think an independent uh, office should be created to oversee ADS or the use of ADS? Um, I think that would be more beneficial since the executive order would be administrative um, administration dependent and that the next mayor of this office could not exist and then therefore the efforts of the task force in, um, in the city could have to restart again. So, so I think you all are disappointed that uh, individual agencies weren't examined and, and we, we have no idea, we still have no idea what's going on. Um, would you say that? Because I'm kind of disappointed in that. I can keep going. All right. <laughs> yes. Um, but can I add one thing? I think part of the disappointment, too, is that you had participation from agencies that ha are in the process of either designing and implementing ADS, with MOCJ and ACS being two that you mentioned. And there's actual concerns about the design of those ADS right now, like whether the MOCJ um, new pro pretrial risk assessment tool complies with the new bail reform and other concerns, and it just seems like a missed opportunity to have not discussed both the systems and design and those that are currently being used. Anybody else? Sure. What's also so clear from all these examples that have showcased flawed, discriminatory, or racist ADS that it's so crucial to open it up to public and independent review. And if that is not, bun not done properly and just stays in the hands of one entity, we can't believe that um, its, due diligence, its due diligence is being done. Yeah, and I think that there's a feeling that there was a lack of progress that was made with the task force, and they had a lot of resources and a lot of experts who were part of the um, discussion process, including these agencies, and it would have been great if they had been able to dive in a little bit more um, and actually look at what algorithms are being used and um, develop some more resources moving forward. But you all agree that there was a lot to do in the task force. They, they had a, a, a tremendous responsibility, but a lot of work ahead of them, and maybe um, they could have, uh, you know, go back and, and like they said, it, it might evolve. But their recommendation was an officer handling this, which that might not be enough, right? Do, do you all agree that you said you kind of agree on that? Yeah, and one thing I, I think that we're also concerned about is that a lot of the responsibilities that were given to the task force are now being transitioned to this officer, and uh, it's unclear what resources they're going to have um, and what their ability is going to be to, to tackle a lot of these issues. Right. right. And I'll add, I... I've constantly admitted that the scope of the task force was quite large, and I think all of us would agree with them that it was a broad and complex issue they're dealing with. But I don't think it was insurmountable, as they try to suggest, because I think the Shadow Report, our community event we did last month um, in Riverside 
church shows that you can actually come up with something. We wrote the shadow report within like two months, so a shorter timeline than the city had. We put together a community event that had over 100 um, community members present for over five hours. <laughs> um, and it was a larger report, actually, than the administration. Yeah. So it's kind um, of... So I don't think yeah. it's fair to right? say that just because it was a large scope and you're dealing with complex issues that the sort of minimal recommendations and minimal public engagement that came out of that process was sufficient. Right, but sometimes, I mean, I, in my experience in life that if you get 17 people, it, it's a daunting task. I'd rather keep any committee smaller, so, but that's another problem, you're not including. Uh, so it's, a, it's, you know, you try, you're sometimes stuck between a rock and a hard place on this, but it, it, was, a, it was a, again, it was a daunting task. Uh, I think we had some competent people um, but I think we all agree that maybe in examining the agencies, how they're using it now and how they're misusing it would, would, would be nice to know. I and mean, we have to know this. So um, any, other, any other comments? Or? I would just like to add, I know I did a lot of, it's in my written testimony, yeah. but um, there, I think th there is a lot of urgency on this issue in expression. I wanted to emphasize the point I made about what's happening on the federal level and that the primary mitigation mechanism we have right now is litigation in many of the cases that you cited and we cited are the result of years of a very expensive and long litigation. But even in those cases, they're not finding full redress or not seeing the full structural change within agencies. And I don't think that approach to both understanding um, government use of these issues or addressing them is going to be sufficient moving forward. Um, so I think th in addition to we need to know what is happening in the city, there needs to be more urgency in how we can effectively address these issues because I don't think current administrative um, challenges, which is the primary mechanism of challenging ADS use right now, is sufficient. And um, I would point to the case in Brooklyn with the Atlantic Tower residents, where they did a state administrative appeal, and DHCR, in fact, was not really prepared for that challenge. And ultimately, it resulted in the landlord um, taking back the, the the fact that they were going to do modification, but I think that case demonstrates that administrative appeals in our agencies are not very prepared for dealing with these challenges, as the chair suggested. Thank you very much, and thank you for the report. It was uh, very useful. Yeager. Uh, Councilman Yeager, you have a question for this panel? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yes, this, uh, I have a question for Ms. Hecht Falella. Um, for purposes of devising and implementing automated decision systems, do you believe that the police department is, say, the functional equivalent of the sanitation department or the buildings department or the Department of Education or any other department in the city? Are you talking about in the level of complexity of the algorithm? I'm talking about in the level of make it public what they do and how they do it. Um, so if you're addressing concerns about public safety? I'm asking you, do you believe that um, that well, let me rephrase it in another way. You referred to um, a report that you received that was a heavily redacted document that failed to shed light on a number of key issues. Do you believe that the police department may have a legitimate reason for not putting certain information out in the public domain? I think that in certain cases, yes, there could be a legitimate reason for not releasing information. However, in, in this situation, we weren't asking for specific information about um, particular cases or things like that. I think it's important that transparency applies not only to other agencies like DOB or Department of Sanitation, but also to the NYPD because um, it has real implications for fundamental rights for New Yorkers. For okay. The so now that, now that I framed it and now that you've answered that question, let me go back to my first question. Do you believe that for purposes of disclosing the methodology that by which an agency devises how it designs and implements an automated decision system, is the police department the functional equivalent of the sanitation department? I don't know if I would say they are a functional equivalent, but I do think that they should be subjected to the same kind of transparency measures as any other Okay, agency. so good. We're in the same place. Let me ask you a different question. Well, we're not in the same place in agreement, but at least I finally got the answer. Let me ask you another question. On the last page of your testimony, you referred to the Post Act, which has 34 sponsors here in the City Council. Do you know of anybody in the City Council who's an expert on public safety? Uh, there is a public safety committee and... Um, Do you know of any member of this council who's an expert on public safety who's, who ought to be devising the methods at, by which the police department protect New Yorkers? 
I know that the POST Act was drafted by Councilmember Vanessa Gibson um, in conjunction with other uh, council members and other agencies um, and also concern groups like my own. So um, and I believe that it, the bill is carefully drafted in a way that will both protect public safety but also ensure greater transparency. Do you believe your organization is an expert in public safety? Uh, I don't know how you would define an expert in public An safety. expert in protecting New Yorkers from danger. But I do know that well, what, one thing that we advocate for is to ensure that um, greater oversight of the NYPD is possible because it's important that uh, it's not a zero-sum game between public safety and transparency. They can work hand-in-hand. -hand. Improving transparency improves trust in the NYPD um, and accountability, which are really important. Do you trust the New York City Police Department? I don't know how to answer that question. Okay. I have another question, and this will be my last question, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Thank you. Um, you... Uh, your prepared testimony was slightly different than your delivered testimony on page three. I know it looks like I don't pay attention, but I actually do. Um, it, you, in the uh, second paragraph in the middle of the page, you refer to if biased historic crime data is being inputted into, this, into the NYPD's ADS. And in your delivered testimony, you refer to flawed and discriminatory historic crime data, which may be different sides of the same coin. Do you have any evidence that I mean, I, I recognize that you put the word if in front of it, so I'm not, I'm not being accusatory here, but do you have any evidence that biased or flawed or discriminatory historic crime data is being inputted into the NYPD systems? I recognize that your answer may include the notion that, well, we haven't seen, so therefore we can't answer, but if that's the case, that's fine. But do you have any evidence other than that you haven't seen it so you don't know? Um, well, there's, I think, two things to talk about there. The first is that um, that paragraph is talking about three years of Freedom of Information Act litigation that my organization was involved in to try to get more information about the NYPD's predictive policing model. Um, and as a result of that litigation, after three years and a federal court order, we were able to get very redacted information that didn't provide a lot of information about what inputs or outputs they're using. What I was can I ask, you, can I ask you just, I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but can I ask you just on the, on the heavily redacted information that was released following a court order, did the heavily redacted information that was released meet the requirements of the order to release information? In other words, is the police department in compliance with the order with respect to releasing information? I know that my organization did not continue to pursue the, the case, um, but I'm not 100% comfortable. Was the um, police department found in contempt of court, to your knowledge? To my knowledge, they were. Actually, I have not reviewed the case okay. enough to. You feel said you, you about testified that. that your agency, uh, that your organization stopped pursuing the case after the release of the, quote, heavily redacted documents. Is, is, can we take from there that? Your agency, your organization was satisfied with what it received and or uh, determined that as a matter of law, it had no further uh, uh, matter with which to pursue in the federal court on that particular case because what the police department had released was sufficient to meet the requirements of the court. Not at all. I don't think that those are fair assumptions to make. I was not personally with my organization at that time, but I imagine after three years of very expensive litigation, I'm sure that has something to do with it. Um, I just also wanted to point out that when I was talking about flawed um, or biased historic crime data, I was in, in particular referring to stop and frisk, um, in which case there were thousands of New Yorkers who were stopped and frisked, and that data, if that is being put into um, the ADS technology, it has the potential for creating um, kind of a perpetual cycle uh, where the resulting outcomes also contain some of those prejudices. And I don't know if um, Rashida has something she'd like to add as well. Um, so I wanted to add, because I actually did research the, in this, and if you look at my testimony, I think on the second page I reference a law review that I wrote, and in the law review you can see a full chart and citations to this, but I looked at New York City data specifically from the Floyd litigation um, and other documents from DOJ investigations. And we did find that stop and frisk data and other data that shows a racial bias in police practices um, could have been used in some of the ADS uh, used by the NYPD. The reason I say could have is because we don't have transparency about what is actually used. But what I did review is contracts that the NYPD had with specific police predictive policing vendors, um, including Hunch Lab. That's a contract I saw. 
Um, but they had three different contracts with three different predictive policing vendors. And I looked at the factors and types of data that those types of systems use. And it showed that there's a great likelihood that the bias data from Floyd and other um, litigation that's challenging racially biased practices by the NYPD were used in those systems if we could and if we had more information about what the NYPD actually used and whether they did design or implemented any other internal systems, then we would be able to say with greater certainty whether there is a direct connection between bias data and what's used by the agency. Do you have no concern whatsoever with the information being released to, say, you versus being, re being provided to the city council? In other words, giving it to you puts it in the public domain. The bad guy gets the information. You put it on your website. The criminal decides they take a look at your website. They devise something to work around what the police department has devised. So what you're referring to is what's commonly known as gaming, and I don't think that's necessarily a concern if you're referring to the disclosure requirements of 1806 or even the POST Act, because none of those um, bills require operally, operationalized details, and you would need to know exactly how the agency was using a specific system in order to gain with specific certainty, and you'd also need very advanced computer science skills and other um, skill sets to try to do that. But based on these laws, I don't think there is a concern if I had that information, if the city council had that type of information, because some of the comments that I'm making is just based on doing research of specific ADS. But when you actually look at research around the use of these systems, it varies in great um, detail when used by different agencies and different people, because the humans interacting with the systems um, relate to the outcomes there. So. No, in okay. short. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, thank you for so much for the, uh, the panel's testimony and, uh, and the questions that you answered. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, panel three, Christopher W. Boyle, New York City County Defender Services, Lisa Freeman, uh, the Legal Aid Society, and William Vander May. Vandermeer, sorry, is it Wilhelm or William? Uh, it's Willem. Willem, okay. How many more? Okay, whoever wants to start. Yes. Hi, I'm Lisa Freeman. I'm from the Legal Aid Society's Juvenile Rights Practice. Um, I'm here on behalf of the entire Legal Aid Society. We represent some 300,000 clients in legal matters in, the, in New York City every year. Our practice includes our civil practice, which represents people in benefits proceedings, housing proceedings, medical matters. Um, Immigration proceedings, our juvenile practice represents kids who are, whose parents are charged with abuse and neglect or who are charged as juvenile delinquents, and our criminal practice represents people uh, who are charged with crimes in New York City adult court. So we, our clients face the full wrath of automated decision-making systems in New York City. Really, um, and they are really among the most vulnerable because their freedom and their um, their benefits are at issue. Um, I will not read from my testimony. I'll ask you to look at it, but I will just summarize it briefly. Um, essentially, we, we testified in 2017 with regard to these matters and laid out a whole host of concerns. And I would again refer you to that testimony to kind of address some of the specific areas in which we have seen problems with automated decision-making systems, um, including uh, some of which were mentioned earlier. Um, uh, examples of si of our our um, practice finding um, unsound al algorithm based DNA um, interpretation software being used by the office of the chief medical examiner, um, among other things. Um, we are deeply concerned about the use of these systems and about the inability to get the information that we need in order to challenge their use. And um, we. We support uh, Council Member Ku's 
um, proposal to increase reporting. Uh, we we think that transparency, however, is necessary. We think that's a first good a first step, but we don't think it goes far enough, and um, we are concerned that. Um, that essentially as more and more technology comes into use, including facial recognition software and other, um, and other technological um, oversight of the populace, that, we, uh, that New York City, uh, New Yorkers and particularly uh, members of, uh, of our low-income communities are, are placed at risk. So we call on the City Council to increase its oversight and, um, and ask that you uh, move forward with even more stringent legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, Council Members and uh, Chairperson Holden. Uh, thank you for having us all here today. Um, my name is Christopher Boyle. I'm the Director of Data Research and Policy at New York County Defender Services. We're a public defense office that represents New Yorkers in thousands of cases in Manhattan's criminal and Supreme Courts every year. I have been a New York City public defender for more than 20 years, uh, and uh, we are familiar with the, some of the automated decision systems and algorithms that some of the city agencies have used. Uh, we support the passage of 1447, uh, 2019. At a bare minimum, as this law provides, prescribes, the public should know what kind of data is being collected and stored by the city agencies. However, this bill only requires that this information be reported to the mayor and speaker of the council. We urge that this information be made publicly available on the mayor's Office of Data Analytics website, or at the very least that the Office of Data Analytics create a process for members of the public to access this information by request. We also urge that the mayor's Office of Data Analytics be required to offer annual recommendations to the council about the future of data analytics in New York City and steps that the council can take to improve public accountability. We also support 1806. Uh, we similarly support that passage uh, in the sense that it goes further than 1447 in requiring reporting by city agencies about the automated decision systems, ADSs. Primarily, this bill defines ADS and thus lays out the parameters of what types of ADS agencies would be required to report on. However, we believe that the information that this bill requires reporting on it's insufficient to ensure public accountability. For example, this criminal justice agency release assessment was developed over the past several years to better provide courts with additional information about an accused person's likelihood to return to court. CJA has released significant underlying information about the algorithm on their website. This is the kind of information that we believe should be released for every ADS used in the criminal legal system as well as other city agencies. But we believe that even more is needed as we noted about the validity of a risk assessment instrument depends on its ability to be validated and replicated by others. Thus, we recommend that agencies be required to provide the underlying data and algorithms to the Office of Data Analytics so that interested third parties, particularly universities, think tanks, can successfully replicate the validation studies and publish the results to the public. The National Institutes of Health has a good model for this, whereby they maintain private health data set but allow that scientists access to the data sets for future research. The Office of Data Analytics should develop a similar process informed by existing models in medical and scientific research to allow for third-party validation and study of city data and algorithms. The data formatting for ADS should also be dictated by the Office of Data Analytics to ensure that researchers can easily use the data. Finally, the Council should ban city agencies from contracting with companies to purchase or adopt proprietary algorithms that cannot be reviewed by the public. Um, Willem's here from my office. He's a data scientist. He knows a lot and can probably answer some questions on the math side of some of this. Um, I would just add that I, I do think the most important part of this is that the city not hire agencies that have proprietary interest in the algorithms, as they'll never allow us to see uh, the underlying math of what they're doing. Um, I don't think that we have to know individual uh, cases, uh, such as some of the, the questions that were asked of our, the prior people that were up here. Um, but I think it's important to know that the algorithms are doing what they're supposed to do and that they're being validated by other agencies. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the testimony and suggestions, which were very good. Thank you. He doesn't have a statement right now. We're just here for questions. I, you know, I, 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 uh, I really like the, um, especially um, 
on uh, if there's no review of the software allowed um, and the algorithms um, that we should you're right which is a very very good point so um, you mentioned the individual in your office uh, that we should uh, contact Willem's here he okay well he can answer I'm some questions I'm sorry, I, some I, of the missed, math. I, I missed okay. that thank you um, so um, uh, if, if, you, if we can get your contact information, we probably have it already. Uh, My contact information is on there. You can contact yeah. me, and we because there, there are some questions that we absolutely you know, we may want to answer uh, any of them. You know, address in, in future hearings, and, sure, which are very very important. Um, do you have any? Answer already. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very, very good. Thank you. Uh, panel four, uh, Emmanuel Midi, it looks like. Radicalexchange.org. Uh, Lindsay. Graybeal, Grayerbeal, Grable, sorry, uh, representing Stop Surveillance Technology Oversight Project, and uh, Mark Canellis uh, is from the AI Policy Committee. Whoever wants to start, yes, thanks. To the members of the Committee of Technology, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Emmanuel Mitty. I am a leader in the Radical Exchange Movement, which is a global community of technologists, artists, activists, and academics dedicated to reexamining the basic institutions of capitalism and democracy in order to build a more collaborative society. While this may sound abstract, our ideas and research are not. We believe, for example, that fairly straightforward redesigns of ballots and voting systems would result in a more accurate aggregation of group preferences, preferences that redesign public matching fund systems could revolutionize problems such as participatory, participatory budgeting and campaign finance. I am here, however, to talk about data. The question of who gets to control and profit from data may turn out, turn out to be the single most important battleground in the political economy of the 21st century. And the course we set now could have resounding implications. Others have observed that the introductions 1446 and 1806 may serve as safeguards against unconstitutional and discriminatory uses of data, or they may force agencies to take inventory of their own practices. These are important consequences, but there is another dimension of this analysis that has received less attention today. Specifically, I am thinking about the possibility for individuals and communities to control and collectively bargain over the downstream uses of their data. Data is an unusual asset that has no exact parallel in economic history. Among other peculiarities, data is very rarely truly personal and almost always inextricably interpersonal. Information about my behavior is also information about my friend's behavior. My genetic information also contains information of my family members. Its value is extraordinarily opaque. Often its value increases with scale because information from different people complements each other, forming an exponentially more accurate picture but it is impossible for ordinary people to know when these increasing return processes are occurring. Its uses are unforeseeable. It may be combined with other data to achieve purposes that could not have been imagined ex ante. This adds up to a gigantic market failure, which is playing an increasingly, increasingly important role in the concentration of wealth and the disillusionment of millions of participants in the economy. In order to gain traction on this urgent problem, Radical Exchange Foundation has published a proposal we call the Data Freedom Act, which sketches a regulatory framework that would enable collective bargaining over the value and uses of data through entities. You can think of these as data co-ops, data trust, or data unions. Their goal will be to restore balance to a distorted market by consolidating bargaining power concerning the value and uses of data. As I have noted, the problem of understanding downstream uses of data and bargaining over them is a matter of enormous complexity. The collective bargaining architecture we envision is likely to be a necessary step towards a fairer data economy, but it will not thrive without the support of policymakers. Asking data users to accountably articulate and disclose the purpose for which they are using data is a reasonable way of reducing the complexity of the problem. It is a precedent that could well pave the way for a much broader wave of innovation concerning the dignified, fair, and responsible use of data, 
I thank you for your time and would be delighted to answer your questions or speak to any of you further. Good morning. My name is Lindsay Greibel, and I'm the civil rights legal intern for the Surveillance Technology Oversight Project. Today, I will be reading excerpts of the written testimony being submitted on behalf of Technology Director Liz O'Sullivan. Stop fights to end discriminatory surveillance and challenges both individual misconduct and broader systemic failures. I am here today in support of Intro 1806 and greater transparency about automated decision systems in New York City. ADS have direct and substantial effects on our lives. From what advertisements are displayed on an individual's computer screen, where students are sent to school, to how long judges sentence someone to jail, ADS impact us every day. It is impossible to know if ADS are engaging in discriminatory or deceptive practices without information about how they make their decisions. Algorithmic, algorithmic transparency is a vital component of avoiding unaccountable bias decisions. Here in New York City, the ADS task force did not provide needed recommendations on how to regulate government use of ADS. Transparency about government ADS was instrumental to the task force being able to accomplish their goal. Yet, the mayor's office would not provide a list of current ADS to the task force, capping their ability to create meaningful recommendations about ADS regulation. Advances in technology and its growing use continue to outpace the willingness of the government to regulate ADS. ADS opacity undermines public trust. I urge you to question why an agency would not want the public, or even of a morally appointed task force, to know what ADS it currently uses. Reporting every ADS used by city agencies is a, re is a reasonable ask. Intro 1806 does not require protected information, such as its source code, to be shared. The impact and outcomes of ADS decisions cannot be researched without, algorith without algorithmic transparency. Without transparency, we can't assess how ADS usage under real-world conditions can introduce or augment bias. Interacting with ADS can alter, in unintended ways, how an individual makes a decision through misguided trust of ADS. Advanced technology does not always lead to greater and better outcomes, and algorithms may amplify biases, not dismantle them. Examples of ADS errors are both numerous and heartbreaking. Virginia and 28 other states use ADS in sentencing decisions. ADS claimed to predict the future, scoring defendants on their chances of reoffending. It missed the mark. The ADS generated scores that would have made racial and age disparities in sentencing worse, wrongfully leading some young defendants and black defendants to being sentenced longer than pre-ADS sentencing. It wasn't just bad data being input that produced this outcome. It was also how the judges interacted with the score by increasing the sentence based on the ADS suggestion. Chicago Department of Children and Family Services adopted an ADS to determine which children were at high risk of injury or death. It failed miserably. Overwhelming caseworkers with thousands of high-risk children to prioritize, yet child deaths continued to happen without ADS prediction. ADS was not predicting any of the worst cases. Instead, it diverted caseworker attention to others falsely deemed the highest risk. How the ADS was coming to its decisions was secret, so caseworkers did not, not, did not know what would give a child a high-risk score. Poor training on how caseworkers should interact and interpret the data was at the crux of the problem. The goal is greater ADS transparency, to ensure that bias and discrimination are not amplified by ADS or its users. Government agencies should not be allowed to hide behind the fallacy of math washing, where ADS are given a dangerous illusion of objectivity. It is time for government use of ADS to come out of the black box. We need transparency to ensure we have the necessary checks and balances to keep communities safe from algorithmic bias. It is critical that we have public oversight of how our city government uses these forms of technology. Today, I urge you to pass intro 1806. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think it's, is it still morning? Good afternoon. Um, Good morning, Chairman Holden, Member Yeager, and other members of the Committee on Technology. My name is Mark Canaeus, and I serve as the Vice Chair of the Artificial Intelligence and Autonomous Systems Policy Committee of the IEEE, the largest association of technical professionals in the world, with over 419,000 members in 160 countries. I hold a PhD in Aerospace Engineering from the Georgia Institute of Technology, where my ADS design research was funded by the Department of Defense and the National Science Foundation. I previously served as an IEEE Fellow in the U.S. House of Representatives, 
and am now a law student at NYU and a current intern with the Federal Defenders of New York. Uh, the specific inclusions of this testimony are my own, and I apologize as my written testimony was left at home, but is on its way. No easy answers. That was the conclusion of the ADS task force chairs when faced with the challenges of governing artificial intelligence and ADS. As an ADS researcher, I must respectfully disagree. There are easy answers, answers embedded in numerous ethical, government's ethical AI principles and professional design standards. The easy answer is to require good design and ask, does it work? Any designer should be able to answer the following before their ADS is ever deployed. What are its capabilities and limitations? How will it affect users, organizations, and target populations? And has it been verified and validated? The power of does it work is that it is a factual question. It does not require new knowledge from designers, and it is easily added to the two bills under consideration today. Requiring good design will not stop all of the inequitable, unaccountable, and opaque ADS, but it will stop much of the tragic experimentation of pseudoscientific techno-solutionist ADS that is used on New Yorkers who need protection the most. Consider the Medical Examiner's Forensic Science Tool, or FST, which was developed here in New York City to assist with DNA identification. While DNA is the standard bearer of forensic the gold standard of forensic evidence, FST is the standard bearer of bad design. So much so that the architect of the FBI's DNA database testified that FST was not defensible and courts have declared that there is no scientific consensus in favor of its legitimacy. Now cases using FST evidence are being reviewed across New York and FST has been abandoned. But this is little consolation to the over 1,300 defendants who had their liberties and freedoms taken away by an illegitimate ADS. Compare this to the aviation community where I was trained, where we are deeply aware of the fact that we are responsible for the safety of millions. Look no further than the Boeing MAX 8, which had two fatal accidents before its bad design was acknowledged and the aircraft was grounded. Within a year, Boeing's CEO was fired, Boeing and the FAA have lost international credibility, and Congress demanded public testimony. Not reacting would have been unthinkable to our community. But that is exactly what has happened in New York. FST did not work, but it was used and then abandoned without any repercussions or oversight. Perhaps those in power react to Max 8 accidents because it was easy to imagine that they themselves were victims of an accident. But too many, when they learn of the city's numerous ADS, do not empathize. They cannot imagine being affected by the criminal justice system, child services, or the housing authority. But the suffering of those affected here in New York are every bit as real as those who suffered due to the Max 8. And not reacting to the badly designed ADS in this city is just as unthinkable. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I'm hamper, happy to answer any questions. Um, thank you. Um, Mr. Mitty, do you have a, you said you published a, your organization Data Freedom Act. Do you have a, how do we get a copy of that? Um, I think I gave one copy. I have a, an extra one here, but uh, yeah, I have copies that I think I put a front for. Okay. Did, did you all read the report from uh, the task force? Did, and uh, any opinions? On, uh, I know you, you mentioned some in your testimony, but any other uh, glaring omissions in there that you found other than what you testified? Um, Anybody? I, I think it's been voiced before. I think transparency, more transparency, I think. Well, that seems to be like the, the problem that most people find, and this, that's what's needed in this, in this area of ADS. Yeah. But um, do you all agree that it was uh, getting 17 to 20 people in a room and at, at different times is difficult uh, and, and, and under time constraints? But um, I said I would have liked some individual agencies um, examined. Do you all agree with that, that we should have some kind of transparency on the agencies that are using this? Um, I'm sorry. If I, if I may, just to, do, just to deal with the, the fact there was, uh, it was discussed that this was a very complex subject and it's very hard to do. Um, I agree that it's complex, um, but that doesn't mean there's not anything for the task force to do beyond just recommendations or just establishing an office. Um, in my written testimony, um, I discuss how in the same two years that this task force um, existed, um, the Department of Defense established AI principles, um, the White House just released AI principles, the Council of Europe, who's responsible for human rights across the EU, established principles, uh, the Data Ethics Commission of Germany established principles. And it's hard, it's hard for me to see how 
any more difficult it was for those bodies than it was for these because they were relying, as the Shadow Report was able to write itself so quickly, was because this has been talked about a lot for many years. Um, and it seems like they could have, the New York City was on the cutting edge. Um, and now it's honestly behind the wheel. Okay. Well, uh, so you, when your testimony comes in, we'll look at that, and uh, it, there, there's more to it, obviously, uh, that we have to discuss, but we, we're, we're interested in talking to you some more, all of you. Thank you so much. Thanks for your testimony. This is the fifth panel, Tom Speaker, Reinvent Albany, and Noel, Noel Hidalgo from Beta NYC. Is there anybody else that would like to uh, sign up or just to see? Anybody else? Okay. Oh, Eric Ulrich, Councilman Eric Ulrich just arrived. Great timing. <laughs> Okay. Uh, good morning, Chair Holden and members of the New York City Council Technology Committee. My name is Tom Speaker, and I'm a policy analyst for reInvent Albany. reInvent Albany advocates for transparent and accountable government in New York State. We were instrumental in the passage of New York City's 2012 open data law and subsequent amendments. Before testifying on introduction number 1447, reInvent Albany reiterates its request that this committee hold a hearing on the 2019 open data progress report. The Council Technology Committee has held a hearing annually for years, but did not in 2019. Council oversight is critical to ensure city agencies continue to make progress in identifying and releasing data sets to the public as required under Local Law 251 of 2017. Regarding introduction number 1447, reInvent Albany supports the intent of this bill to inventory the city agency's data. However, we believe the bill should be reworked to reflect the experience with agency compliance with the open data law and the open data examination process. Unfortunately, city agencies have failed in the past to inventory data despite various requirements in state law, the city charter, and the administrative code. We believe another law requiring the creation of agency data directories will be largely ignored. Our take is that the fundamental question here is how do we get agencies to comply? We believe the answer is to expand and accelerate the open data examination process led by MODA, which has already created data directories for nine of the city's biggest agencies. There are several existing laws regarding inventorying of agency data the city is required to follow. The New York State Freedom of Information Law requires that each agency shall maintain a reasonably detailed current list by subject matter of all records in the possession of the agency, whether or not available under this article, meaning FOIL. It further requires that each agency shall update its subject matter list annually, and the date of the most recent update shall be conspicuously indicated on the list that is to be posted on the agency's website and the New York State, on, uh, the New York State Committee on Open Government's website. Uh, the MTA is one agency that does provide a comprehensive list of the subject matter of its records. So under the city charter, the Commission on Public Information and Communication, COPIC, is required to annually publish a public data directory of city agency data. However, COPIC has rarely published a data directory in the last three decades. The open data law, it's local law 11 of 2012, required agencies inventory data by 2018 to identify data sets to put into the city's open data portal. Yet agencies did not meet the deadline despite having six years to do so. Local Law 8 of 2016 required MODA to work with nine agencies over three years to identify data sets for publication, and as part of that process, develop a list of all public data sets that such mayoral agencies did not make available on the city's open data portal, which is effectively a data inventory. Local Law 8 has expired, but MODA tells us creating a data inventory as part of implementing that law was useful in fulfilling the requirements of Local Law 251 of 2017. Under Local Law 251, MODA has worked with agencies to annually identify data sets city agencies possess that they can release in the next year in the city's open data portal. reInvent Albany therefore recommends amending the Speaker's Bill to integrate the ex expired examination procedure in Local Law 8 into the current process of data publication MODA is implementing with agencies under Local Law 251 of 2017. Um, specifically, we rec re recommend the following, and I'll try to go through this faster for the sake of time. Uh, require that MODA design a plan for 10 agencies a year to inventory their data. 
Uh, the next one is require MER to execute the plan with the designated agencies and provide the data inventory to the mayor's office, the council speaker, and the public. Uh, MOTA has already completed data inventories with nine agencies. Uh, next is prioritize the data inventory of the biggest agencies first. Uh, after that is require agencies update their data set inventory annually after they've been inventory with MOTA's help. Um, require all requested information in the bill about the data sets in the inventory be shared with the mayor's office and council, including data sets protected from public release because of concerns over cybersecurity, public safety, or individual privacy. And finally, require disclosure of all agency public data directories in the open data portal, exempting data sets shared with the mayor's office and council when the public does not have a legal right to know whether they exist or not. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, hello. My name is Noel or Noel. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm the executive director of Beta NYC. Um, you do not have my written testimony because I submitted it digitally. So, Irene, it's in your inbox. Um, it's also on our website, beta.nyc. So, that's a cheap plug to go to our website and get some data from you. Um, so, Happy New Year. Um, we're glad to see the chairman's enthusiasm for using technology for good. Um, it has been kind of difficult difficult to keep up with all of the hearings that you're having, and I love that. Um, but I want to really focus on um, uh, the aspect of 1447, but before getting to 1447, I want to just specifically amplify the great testimony of other members of the Shadow Report. Um, the only thing that we have to add as from Beta NYC is that we would love to see uh, 1806 adopt the Shadow Task Force definition of ADS. Uh, it's very clean and simple. Um, and uh, you should read the shadow report to hear the definition. I will focus now the rest of my testimony exclusively on 1447. Um, we echo many of the concerns and statements that reInvent Albany uh, has stated. We've been longtime allies since the open data law was passed. Um, fundamentally, we think that this bill's framework uh, needs to align with existing mode of reporting requirements. Uh, first and foremost, um, you haven't had an open data hearing. We would love to have an open data hearing. It's really important that council uh, brings MOTA in front and essentially asks them. Um, so we would like to have this particular bill essentially fall in line with that same reporting requirement uh, date, um, which is towards September, if I'm not mistaken. Um, the other concern that we have is around scaling uh, this particular bill. The way that it's currently written is pretty much um, you have all mayoral agencies have to re respond according to the deadline, um, and we feel that that actually uh, creates some difficulty through the experience of the EMV process, the examinations, verifications, uh, uh, there was actually a learning process that MOTA went through. Um, and we would love to see how, since this is going to be going deeper into every single agency, how is it scaled in such a way, uh, echoing reInvent uh, Albany's uh, statement around starting off with 10 agencies, figuring out how to go deeper, uh, and then applying that practice uh, universally. Uh, thank goodness um, we have such a great agency um, called NYC Emergency Management, which already does continuity of operations planning. Um, so they already have a list of technology systems that need to be duplicated in two different locations and seeing how those are the most important data systems and technology systems that our city has, maybe we should start off with that particular list. Um, our friends in uh, John Hopkins at GovX Labs also has a very clear um, kind of outline on how to marry data inventories with priorities and goals. The biggest concern in, um, well, outside of figuring out how to strategically set up the, this revamped EMV process is fundamentally around accountability. Um, we have had a great relationship with MOTA, um, but we have been in this room several times where MOTA is essentially bearing the brunt of uh, responding for mayoral agencies and poor leadership at several agencies. Um, as part of the examination, the most recent examination and verifications report, uh, Department of Transportation indicated that it would post an additional 85 data sets on or before the 31st of December 2019. Um, and as of yesterday, uh, only 45% of those data sets, so 39 data sets were actually 
posted. So that means over a majority of DOT's data sets that they say that they were going to post uh, were not on the open data portal. And they're one of the most data focused uh, department uh, um, agencies. They're also one of the few agencies that has openly thrown open their doors and said, hey, open data community, tell us what data you want us to publish. Um, and if we have it, and if we can sanitize it, we'll publish it. Um, so we would really love for this bill to f give a framework to actually pull agency um, leaders into this room so that way you can hold them accountable. The second part around accountability is essentially around reviving the city's data directory. 27 years since its first publication, none of the open data and open government bills uh, that have passed by city council ever gets us to where we were in 1993. Um, and what was interesting in the 1993 data directory is that we had agency contact information, public liaison contact information, agency mission statement, and then we also have something that's very unique, which is essentially an application name, a year that that application was started, an application description, and then the database contents. This bill, this piece of legislation that is essentially led and sat dormant um, in our city charter uh, needs to be revived. And I think that this particular piece of legislation is the best way to, to get there. Um, it will fundamentally get us to the point where we can hold agencies accountable based upon what technology systems they have, the data that is underlying all of those different systems. Um, and this bill, these two bills um, only take care of well, there are two of three bills um, that should be discussed. The third bill is fundamentally around transparency of code, software code. We don't have, um, at this time period, a clear understanding of what is the software in uh, or that our city produces. Um, so if we say in code we trust, we should be able to see what that code looks like uh, and whether it's law or our software or algorithms, uh, we fundamentally need to have digital government transparency. Uh, and I think that this particular bill can help us get there. Well, wow, thank you. Thank you both for your suggestions. Uh, uh, they're going to be very valuable. Um, I just want to know, I just want to say that we are scheduling an open data hearing. Uh, you'd be, we just put in a request, so um, we hope to get in the uh, next couple of hearings that we will have. Um, will be uh, well, at least one will be on the open data, um, and reinvent Albany. I just, Tom, I want to thank you for some suggestions here that we're going to bring back to um, the bill sponsors, which are, I think, a, a, a definite improvement. So I just want to thank you again for the testimony. Anything else? Or? Okay. Thanks so much. Um, anybody? Anybody else? Nobody else? No other speakers? And uh, no other panel? Uh, we're adjourned. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Uh, okay. All right. Thank you. Hearing's closed. <laughs>